I'd like to welcome our speaker tonight, um, Eileen Davis. Eileen is an environmental educator with the Lake County Forest Preserve. And tonight she's gonna to talk to us about Habitat Guide to Birding. Welcome, Eileen. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with um, with you this uh, tonight. I'm very excited to share with you my love of birding and um, some of the neat places that are really close to us here in Lake County where you can go and see a variety of birds. Uh, the way we've got it, the, the program set up is we sort of do a year, um, a cycle of a year. So we'll, we're, we're partway through the year already, but I'll take you through uh, the different kinds of birds you might see at different times of the year and some of what we call the birding hotspots or, or good places to go, reliable places to go with the right habitat to kind of help you um, get a, a really good chance of being able to, um, to find as many different birds as you can. Um, so without, um, I guess, any further ado, I will go ahead um, and get started here. I am going to turn my camera off just because um, it helps me to see the screen a little bit better. And um, Roz, I still have the poll up. Did you still want that up? No, I think you should be able to X out of it. Can you do that in the upper right corner? Let me see here. Oh, I've got that little bar. Kind of, oh, there we go. Oh, okay, got, great. There we go. So I just turned my camera off just because it helps me see the screen a little bit better. Um, but as I just wanted to um, do a brief introduction of myself and the Lake County Forest Preserves for those of you who may not be quite as familiar with us. Uh, my name is Eileen Davis and um, I've been an environmental educator uh, for close to 25 years now. And most of that time has been with the Lake County Forest Preserves. I, I started my career with them and have traveled around a little bit, but um, the bulk of my career has been right up here in Lake County. Um, I live here in Lake County. I bird in Lake County. <laughs> um, and one of the things I really love about my job is um, you get to be sort of a generalist as an environmental educator here in, um, in the forest preserves, we are, um, our sort of role within the forest preserves mission is to connect folks with our Lake County forest preserves with, and be able to know uh, and understand to be able to teach about the plants, the animals, uh, the different habitats, how they all interact with each other. Uh, we get to learn about all the really neat, interesting projects that our ecologists and biologists are doing so that we can then communicate that with the rest of the public. So um, I get to, as part of my job, spend time learning about birds and wildflowers and insects, which I find really fun. Um, so it, but I will say that if I had to pick one area as my absolute favorite, it is bird watching. Um, it is uh, a part of my job that is also a very passionate hobby of mine. And I do spend quite a bit of my free time um, out in various habitats, searching out birds. I plan vacations around new places to go to find new birds. Um, so it, it, it's um, something I really love to talk about and share. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, and again, as we're going along, please feel free to throw any questions you might have in the chat. And I'm gonna just um, uh, check that periodically to make sure I'm catching questions. But uh, Roz, if you want to holler out if I've missed something, you can feel free to just jump in and, and um, share some of those questions with me so we don't get too far behind on those. So um, I just want to start with a, a broad overview and uh, give you a sense of uh, the variety of bird life we have here in Lake County. And according to eBird, which is a uh, uh, a sort of a conglomeration. It's through um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but it's it's essentially a, a place where um, folks that do a lot of bird watching can input uh, their sightings. And it's also a great uh, resource for scientists because it's everyday people who are out bird watching all across the country. Um, and they're inputting their, 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 the birds they've seen, how many they've seen, where they've seen them. And it, it gives the um, scientists some really great data to be able to um, to check trends and that sort of thing. So it's a website you may want to check out. Uh, but according to eBird, there are about 351 different species of birds that either um, 
live year round here in, in Lake County or visit at some point of the year, so during some point of the year. So it could be during migration, it could be that they're just here for the nesting season, or they are species that live here year round, but that's a pretty impressive number. And within Lake County, there are 11 different you know, either forest preserve sites, or I am gonna share some sites that are like state parks or other open space areas. But there's 11 different sites within Lake County with 197 or more different species of birds that could be seen at some point in the year. So we are very lucky and a very diverse um, county. In fact, Lake County is home to more threatened and endangered species than any other county in Illinois. And when I first say that, sometimes folks are, are a little shocked, like what's, what's going on? Why are there so many threatened and endangered species here? It's actually an indication of really um, high quality diverse habitats because we are able to be a safe harbor for these species. We still have open spaces that have been preserved and restored where these um, different animals and plants can live. So it's actually, um, an, like I said, an indicator of really good um, high quality habitat. So this is just a, a, a map of the county here. And some of the hot spots that I'll be referring to today are, um, like I said, it's not just forest preserve sites, but Illinois Beach State Park along the lakeshore, both the south and the north unit are really um, great places to go bird watching. Waukegan Beach is another really good one, especially for shorebirds. North Point Marina, way up at the northern part of the county, it's really great for um, waterfowl. And I'm gonna be giving you guys all this information throughout the rest of the preserve, uh, presentation. So don't, don't worry about jotting down too many notes just yet. Um, just giving you an overview of where some of these uh, spots are located. But North Point Marina in particular is a great one, especially in the winter, if the water stays open, you'll get a lot of waterfowl and, um, and things that'll, that'll be in the open water feeding. Fort Sheridan Forest Preserve. Uh, is, a, is again along the, you're seeing a pattern here along the lakeshore um, and Fort Sheridan's really great for hawks and during migration. Chain of Lakes State Park up in the northwest part of the county, again lots of water, um, big open space, lots of different kinds of birds can be found there. Spring Bluff Forest Preserve which is um, up in the, the northern part of Lake County. Rollins Savannah Forest Preserve in the Grays Lake area. It's actually uh, recognized as an important bird area by the National Audubon Society because of the large size of the habitat. And also there's a variety of uh, grasslands, uh, oak savanna, uh, marshes, and other wetland types that are there. Middle Fork Savanna in the Lake Forest area. Again, very similar type habitat as far as there's some oak savannas there. There's different marshes and wetland habitats as well as grasslands. Ryerson Woods, which I'm lucky enough that my office is located at Ryerson Woods down in the southern part of the county um, along the Des Plaines River there on the eastern side of the Des Plaines River. You typically find areas that are more forested and so you get a lot of woodland birds that will come there. And Independence Grove Forest Preserve um, in the Libertyville area. And that's got that big lake there, which again, if the lake um, isn't frozen over in the cooler parts of the year, you can definitely get a lot of different water birds that will, will hang out there. And I could probably put a little red splotchy star <laughs> on most of our forest preserves anywhere really where you're gonna have open space is gonna be really good for birds. Um, open space with native plants and um, and as we talk about the different areas and habitats where these birds will, will be able to con congregate and concentrate in numbers, um, I'll put in a little plug for adding native plants to your home landscape because the more native plants you provide, um, it's food for the birds, it's shelter for the birds, um, whether they're eating berries or seeds or eating the insects that are feeding on the native plants. So um, there's my little plug for adding native plants to your garden. So as I said earlier, we're going to kind of go through a year in Lake County and talk about um, the types, the big groups of birds that are coming through the area um, and where you might be able to, to spot them. And we're gonna start in early spring, which we consider March and April. And that's typically the time of the year when you're gonna be looking for waterfowl. So the ducks and the geese, that sort of thing, shorebirds and then passerines. And the passerines are those small little perching birds. 
And we'll go through each of these uh, categories here. I'm gonna start with waterfowl. And I've tried to, or I, I have labeled all the pictures here that I've got, um, just so I'm not having to um, um, constantly, uh, you know, just bore you with bird names. So I won't do too much of that. Uh, but I do love this, this duck here, uh, the Northern Shoveler. Uh, they look similar to a mallard, but if you take a look at his head and his beak there, I mean, they just have an enormous bill. And um, that's how they got their name, the shoveler. So they use that to root around in the water looking for aquatic plants to eat. And when we talk about waterfowl, we're, talk we're gonna put them into two different groups. There's um, what we call the big water divers. And you find these guys on uh, big lakes like Lake Michigan or the lake at Independence Grove, um, the bigger rivers. And these are the birds that are going to be <clears throat> diving down into the water in search of fish or uh, you know, mussels or um, clams, that sort of thing, aquatic insects. And so they, they tend to be on the bigger water. Some of the highlights in early spring are when the loons come migrating through. And I typically see them, I live up in the Lake Villa Lindenhurst area and I've got a couple of lakes near me. Hastings Lake Forest Preserve is one. Uh, McDonald Woods Forest Preserve is another one that's got a lake on it. And um, I, I, every year, every single year there are loons on Hastings Lake. And it's usually late March, early April. It just depends kind of on when the ice comes off the lake. And I live close enough that I do sometimes hear them call. Now the loons won't stay here, um, they don't nest here, but they usually stick around or you have them coming through the area for a couple of weeks. And um, typically by the end of April, I'm not really seeing them anymore, but they're just lovely. They sit really low in the water, really pointy beak, um, sort of sink and dive into the water in search of food. Uh, but here are a few other examples, the bufflehead, golden eye, canvas back and the common merganser. Um, and the, um, all of them with the exception of the loon, you might find on Lake Michigan or in any of those areas along the, the lake shore um, during the winter months and early spring. The other class of waterfowl are what we call the dabbler ducks. These are the ducks that you find in, in smaller bodies of water, ponds, um, they're, they're, they feed by sort of tipping up, they, they tip their head down in the water and their, their rears, their rear end tips up in the air with, uh, with their little feet and they're eating, um, they're looking for food in more shallow water. So they typically are eating more plant life. Um, they have really neat beaks that have almost, um, it's almost like a, a strainer that you use when you make pasta. So there's sort of these little, um, fringes and they can get a big mouthful of plants and and the water all kind of drains away and then they are able to eat um, eat the, those plants and of course the mallard is pretty familiar to all of us but um, some that may not be quite as familiar the american widgeon very characteristic sort of buffy beige stripe going down his forehead um, toward like towards the front towards the back Wood ducks there in the center are just lovely animals. Um, they actually nest in trees. And so you'll see them flying around uh, the wooded areas along the, the Splains River. Um, and I've even had them nest in an oak tree in my backyard, which was really exciting. Um, and it, it caught the attention of my dog last year when the babies jumped, because the babies just jump right out of the nest hole down onto the ground. And it caused quite a bit of excitement in our backyard. Well, the mama wood duck was gathering everybody up. Um, I live across the street from a little lake and I think she was gonna herd them back over across the street into the water. Uh, there's our Northern shoveler again, you get a good look at the female. And in the case of these um, dabbler ducks, the females tend to be more drab and um, well camouflaged, whereas the males are more showy. Blue wing teal is one of my favorites up there in the top right. Um, they are a bit smaller than a mallard and they're very, the males have that very characteristic sort of white crescent right up there on the, uh, between the beak and the eye. And that's a really great field mark if he's in the water because you don't often see that, that blue um, wing patch that you see in the picture there where he's in flight. Often you'll see them sort of swimming around in little uh, ponds and, and marshes. And these are just a few of the different preserves and open spaces 
state parks uh, where you can find a variety of waterfowl in, in March and April. And again, like I said, a lot does depend on when the ice is out. If we've had a particularly cold winter, sometimes the ice isn't fully off some of these lakes like Independence Grove or some of the smaller inland lakes until late April, or I'm sorry, uh, very late in March or early April. As we continue on in early spring, the shorebirds, which is the next group of birds to kind of come through and make their presence known. Um, there's the American woodcock, which is a funny little bird, really cool little animal. Um, they have that long beak that they use to probe down into the soil to get uh, worms and other soil invertebrates that they'll eat. Uh, but they're probably most well known for their courtship flights, which start again in, in um, depending on the weather, and how uh, warm things are. If the ground is still frozen, they're not really going to be able to feed, so they won't be back in our area until um, the snow is gone and the soil is, is thawed a bit so they can get that beak down in there to feed. But the males will, um, uh, in usually very open areas um, uh, like prairies or uh, wet prairies or marshes, the females are kind of down on the ground and the males do these flights where they go way up high in the air um, before they do that, though, they walk around on the ground doing, making a funny little noise called a paint. So they kind of sound like meh, meh. And then after he does that a few times, he, he zips up into the air um, and then um, slowly drifts back down and the wind whistling through his wings makes just a lovely little whistling sound. Um, and that goes on for a few weeks each year. Um, as we get into May, that's sort of uh, slowing down, but they do it at dawn uh, and dusk. So it's a little tricky to see, but you definitely do hear the paint. Some other shorebirds that come through the area, the least sandpiper and Wilson's plover, um, and then the killdeer. The killdeer will stay here and, uh, and nest, and they have those very characteristic double bands on their neck and chest. And here are some places you may want to go look for shorebirds. Waukegan Beach is a great one. And because it's right there along the lake and the birds use the lakeshore as sort of a migration um, cue, they'll, they'll visually, it's a visual cue for them. There have been some really cool um, spottings of, of birds at Waukegan Beach. Um, the, the woodcocks, you can find them at uh, a variety of different preserves, but Cuba Marsh, Heron Creek, and Ryerson are good bets. I, um, I've seen them up at Grant Woods in the Lake Villa area. I've seen them at, um, I'm sure they're out at Rollins Savannah. I'm sure they're at Hastings Lake. So again, anywhere where you've got some, some uh, wet areas, they, they tend to like that a little bit better. And then that last category of early spring uh, birds that are coming through the passerines, which are those little small perching birds. Um, the winter wren is a species of wren that pops through our area in um, late March and into early April, um, but they don't stick around. They, they move further up north um, as on their, for their nesting grounds. Uh, they're a tiny little sort of drab, nondescript little bird, uh, but with that characteristic wren-like tail that kind of pops up in the air. They're smaller than our house wrens. Um, so that's one way to know for sure. And then if you're seeing them in March or early April, that's not typically when our house wrens come back. So you're, it's another good indicator that it's probably a winter wren. The song sparrows, the red winged blackbirds and the eastern bluebirds all kind of start, um, they all hit the area, get back here about the same time. And um, it's always one of those rituals of spring at the office where somebody comes in and is like, I heard a red winged blackbird or I heard a song sparrow. It's that that harbinger of spring, you know, spring is not far behind. And um, typically I see my first red winged blackbird come back um, very end of February, early March. And then as we get into the, um, again, depending on the weather, as we get in a little bit later in March, then the song sparrows and the bluebirds are back. And sometimes the bluebirds don't leave. If the bluebirds can find food, they are primarily insect eaters which are tough to find in the winter. But if, if, um, if we have a rather mild winter, I know we had somebody send us a picture of, a, of their, their bird bath in the winter time. Um, they had a heater to keep the water from freezing and they had like three or four bluebirds at their bird bath this winter. So those, 
those bluebirds were finding it um, easy to find food and they didn't feel the need to, to migrate further, uh, further south. Passerines um, at any time of year are really, um, your best bets are, are more heavily wooded um, forest preserves. So think places like Ryerson Woods, Half Day Forest Preserve, right, Captain Daniel Wright Woods, um, that, that area down there in the southern part of the county along the Desplaines River, um, MacArthur Woods, Old School Forest Preserve. They're really great places for these small little passerines, especially in the spring. And um, it is, uh, again, another area of Lake County that's been designated as an important bird area by the National Audubon Society because of the quality of the habitat and the amount of habitat that there are, is for birds. Some specialties, we call them, some sort of one-offs that you may um, uh, find coming through in the spring. The yellow-bellied sapsucker is a type of woodpecker that um, comes through. They don't nest here, but you may spot them early in the spring. Turkey vultures make their return early in the spring. They do stay here and nest here, as do the sandhill cranes. Um, sandhill cranes typically start coming through, uh, depending on the weather, um, you know, in March. And then any cranes that you're spotting after the second week of April or so are nesting here in Lake County. If they're still here, by mid-April, they have found um, that they they can find the right habitat to be able to um, to set up a nest. And then a really fun bird that comes through on migration further north is the white pelican. And again, they're coming through in in March and in April. They're huge. They're just these big snow white birds with black tips to their wings. Um, in the spring breeding season, they get that little horn on their on the top of their beak. Um, for some reason, it's it's there in the breeding season, but not other times of the year. Um, and they, uh, you can really stumble upon some huge flocks of these guys. Uh, there was one day at Hastings Lake a couple springs ago in mid-April. There must have been 200 of these birds on that little lake, and it was just fantastic. It was really really fun. But again, they don't nest here. In, um, in Lake County that I'm aware of, um, but there may be some indication that they're nesting out um, into the Chain of Lakes area, possibly in McHenry County. So we're keeping an eye on that, but they do have nests up in central Wisconsin in the Green Bay area, and then up farther north into, um, into Canada and over like in the Northern parts of North Dakota, the Northern Prairie areas. And these are some areas where you might uh, be able to find those specialties again, that Desplaines River important bird area in the southern part of the county and then the Chain of Lakes area is a good um, for the pelicans. Um, and then um, the sandhill cranes all over the county where you've got marshy areas is where you might spot those. Rollins Savannah is a good one, Middle Fork Savannah, um, Cuba Marsh. Those are some ones just off the top of my head where I pretty reliably see sandhill cranes. Before we jump into the the really the month of May, which is just a fantastic um, birding uh, time of the year, uh, I just want to stop real quick and see. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I just wanted to make sure if anybody has any questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. Um, as you're maybe thinking about that or doing that, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about why the month of May is so spectacular for bird watching. And if you're just getting started, with the hobby, I um, it's a great time of year to start. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, all the males are singing, right? It's breeding season, all the male birds are singing. For the a lot of different species of birds, the males are in really bright breeding plumage. And those two things help make identification a little bit easier. You can learn their songs, you can uh, very easily tell them apart for the most part when they're in their breeding colors. Um, and then the third thing that's happening right now is our, our trees don't have a ton of leaves on them yet. And so as, um, and then you've got a lot of birds that are migrating north that some will stay here in Lake County and nest, but the vast majority are going to move farther north, but they're stopping in Lake County and they're stopping in our open areas and our open spaces um, to rest and to refuel. And when there's not a ton of leaves on the trees, it just makes them easier to spot. 
So this is the time of year where during non-COVID <laughs> um, times uh, or pandemic, um, we host a lot of uh, bird walks at the forest preserves and a lot of other local Audubon societies and other open space agencies will host a lot of bird walks too, because it's a great time to get people um, interested in the hobby. It is fairly easy to, to start learning. And we're going to start with um, some of the passerines. Again, these small little perching birds. And this is just a small sample of the, I think it's 23 or 25 different species of what we call warblers um, who come through Lake County on their migration. And it is happening. And it usually starts in, in mid to late April with things like the yellow rumped warbler, which is down there on the bottom right, or the palm warbler. Uh, and then as the season goes on, as the month goes on, then you get things like the Nashville warbler, the common yellow throats and the yellow warblers, black and white warbler. One of my favorites is the black Bernie in there with that bright orange throat. And these guys are little. These guys are chickadee size, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so they're not huge birds, but they just are stunningly beautiful. They have beautiful songs. And it's just a really magical time to be out in our woodlands um, looking at and trying to learn and identify these guys. And um, again, it's an indication of, I think maybe um, maybe you have gone a little too far with my bird watching uh, hobby, but it's almost like old friends, you know, coming through the area because the majority of these guys don't stick around on this page. Um, I believe it's the common yellow throat, the yellow warbler that'll stay here and nest. And so all the other birds, it's it's like, oh, you know, and we, in my little group of folks that I go bird watching with, we have little sh shorthand names. So it's like, well, what's that up there on the tree? Oh, that's Maggie. And we just call the Magnolia, you know, Warbler Maggie or, um, so we have fun little, fun little names for all these birds. But again, a uh, great time of year to be able to start um, uh, bird watching. And then, uh, Somebody's asking, do we find this, the warblers at home feeders? Sometimes you do, and but predominantly, and, and I ask you to look at their beaks. They're sort of pointy tweezer-like beaks, and these guys are predominantly insect eaters. But if it's a cold, um, cold rainy spring and there's not a lot of insects available, they will feed on seeds occasionally. And I've had them last spring. I never, I just kind of kept my suet feeder up for a while. And I had um, a pine warbler, which isn't listed on this page, but it was hanging out. I have white pine trees in my backyard and it was hanging out in my backyard and it was just a really cold, wet, miserable day. And it was uh, picking away at the suet feeder. Uh, but where you're going to find these guys is they're going to be in your trees and they're going to be picking off the caterpillars and the other insects that are, um, that are, eat, you know, up there, maybe feeding on the leaves of your trees. And if you have oak trees in your yard or your neighborhood, look there first. Oak trees are incredibly important for these guys during their migration. Um, again, here I go about the native plants again, but, um, Anytime you can add native plants, it's going to build a little food chain, a little habitat in your backyard, and it'll attract the food that these birds like to eat. So it'll attract the native insects um, and the caterpillars of the native moths and butterflies that these guys will eat. Uh, some of the other birds that I'll show you in a little bit will come to your feeders, um, and I'll be sure to point those out to you as we, um, as we go through. So other passerines as, as that you may find in our woodlands, our grasslands, and our savannas, uh, the indigo bunting, uh, just a stunning little strikingly blue bird. He will come to your feeder. Um, I've had them eat the millet um, at my feeder, so I do leave my seed feeders up at least through the month of May, uh, and these guys will visit those feeders. Uh, Rose-breasted grosbeak in the middle there will come to your feeders. If you look at those sort of triangular really stout beaks, that's telling me that he's a seed eater. So he'll visit a feeder. Scarlet tanagers and uh, Baltimore Orioles will come to the or oranges if you set them out. Um, and then the ruby-throated hummingbird will of, of course come to a feeder uh, and they're back. I've had one for about a week visiting my feeders. So if you haven't put your hummingbird feeders out yet, you feel safe in doing so now. Um, the Orioles will come to your hummingbird feeders too. Um, so will squirrels, uh, but um, every bird on this page here does nest in Lake County. 
And the scarlet tanager is one of my absolute favorites. That's the male there, bright red all over with black wings and a black tail. And um, they're just a stunning bird. And it's, um, it's always so funny to me how they're here, but we rarely see them because they spend a lot of their time up in the tree canopies. And then um, one other quick point about birds coming to your feeders. The Orioles are singing like crazy in my neighborhood right now. They're coming to my oranges, but very soon once they've uh, paired up and they're mated and they've got uh, eggs in the nest and they've got little uh, babies to feed, they're not gonna come to your oranges anymore. And that's because they're, they're spending most of their time finding insects to feed to the babies. So don't worry, they're still here. And I always put oranges out again in August, mid, you know, mid August, because um, I've noticed that the young of the year and then the adults will come to the oranges on their, as they're starting to get ready to migrate south again. And, oh, yay, somebody saw a scarlet tanager. I know they're so pretty. They are just so pretty. And um, some of the places that you'll wanna focus your attentions if you're looking for those passerines at this time of the year, um, Illinois Beach State Park, the South Unit, uh, the Dead River Trail. It goes through um, the Black Oak Savannah there. Fantastic, you're right along the lakeshore and you'll get a good chance of seeing a lot of those little guys. Um, and then of course that Upper Des Plaines River important bird area, can't recommend it enough. <laughs> um, really great for birding. As we move into summer, it gets a little trickier. Um, a lot of the birds are not singing anymore because they've already found a mate and they're very busily uh, feeding their young and raising their young. But it's also, there's a, the leaves are, the trees are fully leafed out. Um, and then a lot of those, those migrants that came through are on their nesting grounds in areas much further north. But you can still see birds and um, I always, uh, uh, focus on the larger birds like rails and herons and and then some of the passerines that you might find in our grassland areas. So that's what we're going to talk about now. And um, these all these birds here on this page will nest here. They're nice and big. Um, the Sora rail is probably the smallest one out of the bunch. It's about the size of a small chicken. Um, and they tend to be pretty secretive, but they have a beautiful call. Uh, but you can find them in places like Middle Fork Savanna and Rollins Savannah. And occasionally you'll get a peek at them as they're moving about during the day. They tend to be out more during the day than some of the other rails that um, nest here in Lake County. And they, they are pretty exclusively a, a, a marshy wetland bird. So you'll, um, and I'll show you on the next slide where to look, but um, places like uh, Rollins Savannah, Middle Fork Savannah, Cuba Marsh are gonna be good places to look for the Sora rail. The egrets and the herons, um, the great blue heron and the great egret, these guys are gonna be, um, uh, they nest in trees typically and they nest in groups, in rookeries we call them. Um, so there's a couple of rookeries around Lake County. Uh, there's a few still probably nesting at um, Almond Marsh, but rookeries, heron rookeries are sort of transitional habitats. What happens is the, the birds start nesting in these trees and um, over time, as, um, as they're up in the trees and they're, um, the trees are in, usually in water, but over time as the trees die or fall down, then the herons will, and the egrets will move on to a new area. So um, the rookery may only be in use for you know, a certain number of years before they move around, but Almond Marsh in the Grays Lake area had a rookery. Um, there are, there's a rookery at Herring Creek that you can spot, um, which is down in uh, the Long Grove area. And uh, I'm trying to think, there's another one. It's not, the, the preserve doesn't have any official access to uh, like through parking, but there is a rookery at the Mill Creek Forest Preserve up in the um, Gurney area. And then Green Herons, they will be pretty easily spotted. Well, I shouldn't say easily because they do try to be pretty secretive, but um, <laughs> this guy um, usually kind of skulking about along the shorelines of small ponds and that sort of thing. I see them pretty regularly at Half Day Forest Preserve um, down in the southern part of the county at the ponds there. Um, Captain Daniel Wright Woods along the pond there, you, you can see them, but I also see them at Rollins Savannah and Middle Fork Savannah. 
And again, um, anywhere up in the Chain of Lakes area as well. Oh, Sedge Meadow, this is a great one. This is a really fantastic preserve um, up in the northern part of the county along the Des Plaines River. And the, the, uh, the habitat characteristics along the Des Plaines River in the northern part of Lake County are very different than down in the southern part. Down in the southern part, it tends to be more forested around the river, whereas up in the northern part of the county, it tends to be more open um, with wet prairies and grasslands around it, uh, marshes. And so you get just a little bit of a different character when you're up there. That preserve is located, the entrance is on Wadsworth Road, just east of, um, of Route 41. And lovely, lovely um, area to go hiking. Uh, it takes you through a little oak savanna. So you get a nice mixture of wetlands and oak savanna. So you can get a nice combination of those um, little perching birds, but also the, the bigger wetland birds that we just talked about. Other passerines that you may spot during the summer months in our woodlands, grasslands and wetlands are gonna be things like um, uh, woodpeckers like the red-bellied woodpecker or wood thrush are going to be more wooded uh, air. Um, you're going to find those more in forested areas. Tree swallows tend to zip around in more open fields um, and over water catching insects. They're just really acrobatic. It's fun to watch them. I mean, look at that tiny little beak on that guy, yet he can somehow earn a living flying around catching tiny insects out of the air. The eastern meadowlark and the bobolink are found in our grasslands in the summer and the meadowlarks will sing and sing and sing and um, so will the bobolinks. One of the things I like about both these birds is though they are ground nesters, they nest on the ground, they often find a tall or a higher spot in the prairie to perch and sing. So if there's a um, you know, uh, uh, one of the tall prairie plants, they'll, they'll pop up there. So once you hear them, they're pretty easy to find. The metal lark can be tricky to find um, if it's on the ground, especially because if you're looking at its back, it's very well camouflaged, but its belly is just bright yellow with that bold black bib there under its chin. So, um, and both of them are, um, you can see the metal lark beak is sort of pointed. They're gonna be eating more insects, but they will eat seeds. And the bobolink has that triangular sort of plier shaped beak. And so he's, he's gonna be eating mostly seeds. Uh, and again, lots of opportunities and options to visit to find these guys in the summer months. Um, you could uh, spend quite a bit of time out there exploring and seeing all kinds of fun birds. So don't give up bird watching in the summer. You just usually tend to change more from a woodland habitat to a, a more open habitat um, and out in the grasslands and the marshes. As we move into fall and we kind of characterize fall as August through November, um, the shorebirds that we found earlier in the spring as they were coming through the area and moving into the area in the spring migration, they're gonna be moving at, um, on down south through the fall and also raptors, um, the big hawks and eagles will be moving through the area. And um, I won't show you the shorebird pictures again because they're the same ones we, we looked at earlier. Um, but again, same locations, Illinois Beach State Park, North and South, Waukegan Beach, Rollins Savannah, Middle Fork Savannah, Cuba Marsh. These are gonna be good places to look for the shorebirds um, during that fall migration. And for shorebirds, that starts in August, believe it or not. A lot of these little guys are as they, they make enormous migration journeys. So some of them will nest way up in Northern Canada and in Alaska, and then they fly all the way down to the tip of South America for their, their, um, their winter migration. It's just incredible. So they do tend to start their journey um, a little earlier than some of the other birds. The big show in fall though, for me, are the, the migrating hawks and other large raptors. And uh, we'll see a map in a second here, but um, two really great spots to look are along Lake Michigan. One is Fort Sheridan and the other is up at Illinois Beach State Park. And there are a group of volunteers that go out and do something called Hawk Watch. And they literally take shifts setting up in, the, in these areas while they're open. And they just watch the birds migrating and count. And it's, it's a citizen scientist collecting data thing. 
Um, but they're really great folks who are happy to answer questions, point out what they're seeing. And um, on some of these fall migration days, you can see some really amazing birds, things that we wouldn't normally see around here, peregrine falcons, rough-legged hawks, broadwing hawks. Um, I was there one day when a golden eagle flew by. It was just amazing. Um, so I, I, if you get a chance to stop by one of those, uh, either Fort Sheridan or Illinois Beach State Park, they, I believe they usually start setting up shop in September, um, possibly earlier, but um, I would uh, highly recommend stopping by and, and, and getting some uh, help in identification. They're really generous with their, their skills and their, and their, um, their talents of identifying. It's amazing to me how they can identify these birds from way off and as they're zipping by. Um, Red-tailed hawks are, are a common hawk in our area and they do hang out here for the most part throughout the year, but you may get some birds migrating through from further north that are gonna head a little south for the winter. Um, the mature adults have that really characteristic reddish brown tail feathers. Um, so those are pretty easy to identify. And I'm gonna pop into the chat real quick and check the question. Oh, somebody's asking where are eagles nesting in Lake County? So we do have nesting eagles in Lake County, which is very exciting. Um, I will admit that I have not been hearing quite as much just yet about where they are this year. But last year, I know there was nests out um, on the Fox River. And if you were at the Fox River Forest Preserve and you were at the marina, you could look across the river and see the nest. Um, there was a nest um, in one of our preserves um, up in the northern part of the county called Ethel's Woods. And um, it's a little tricky to see the nest from the actual parking lot at, at Ethel's Woods. But if you were at the forest preserve across the street from Ethel's Woods called Raven Glen um, on Route 45 there, you could spot the nest. It was this huge nest in a, in a tree way out in, in a in a in an agricultural field. And um, again, I live up in this area. And so it was a real treat because um, especially as the, the summer wore on and the, and the chicks fledged and we're out flying around, you'd get uh, sightings of a couple of immature bald eagles almost on a daily basis as they're learning to be eagles and hunt. Um, those are the two places I know for sure in the past, there have been some, some nests out at uh, Chain of Lake State Park, but I don't have anything um, specific that I can say for sure for this year to tell you. So I don't wanna give you bad information. And again, the Raptors, Illinois Beach State Park at the Hawk Watch Station and also at the Hawk Watch Station at Fort Sheridan. As we get into winter, we're looking at the months of November through February. Um, again, the waterfowl become a focus as long as we've got open water. If everything freezes over, the, the birds are going to move south. But if we've got open water, and typically, um, unless we've got a, a really severe winter, we're going to have some open water on Lake Michigan where you can pretty reliably um, find these guys. Um, owls are another thing to look for in the winter as the leaves fall off the trees and then our, uh, we do have some owls that, that migrate south for the winter and hang out here. And then we also, as we get into late winter, our great horned owls, our resident owls are starting to mate. And so you hear them calling and you may see them a little more regularly too with no leaves on the trees. And then of course there's the resident woodpeckers and other passerines that hang out here all year round. That, and these are the guys that'll come to our feeders. So in the winter, you get some fun waterfowl that will come into our area, the redhead duck and red-breasted merganser. Um, the red-breasted mergansers, I don't believe they nest here. They tend to nest um, uh, further north, but they will come into our area and in the winter during migration, uh, but big numbers of them usually spend the winter offshore on both the east and the west coasts and the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. But because we've got big water here with the Great Lakes, we do get them in the Midwest as well, but these are these uh, both the redhead and the um, red-breasted merganser are going to be some diving ducks. Independence Grove, when it doesn't have ice on the lake, is a good place to spot some of these winter waterfowl, as well as up along the um, the Lake Michigan shoreline. Um, North Point Marina is a good a good place for spotting them as well. 
in winter it is owl time in Lake County too. So on this page here, the two resident owls are the great horned owl and the Eastern screech owl. They live here year round. The great horned owls, as I said earlier, are, are setting up breeding territories and um, pairing up as starting as early as November. So that's usually when I start to hear them calling more frequently um, in, my, in my yard. And it's the males sort of setting, you know, defining whose territory is who. It's the male and female communicating with each other. And typically in February, they're on a nest or they're on eggs. Um, so right now the, the great horned owl babies are, get, are, are fledging, they're are, are leaving the nest. Um, and, but they'll squawk at the parents for the rest of the summer trying to get mom and dad to bring them food. So that's always fun as well. The three that come, um, that find us to be uh, warmer <laughs> than where they live uh, are the short-eared owl, the long-eared owl, and the snowy owl. And we pretty reliably get the long-eared owl and the short-eared owl here in Lake County, but the snowy owl comes in waves. Um, some years we get, get them pretty reliably and other years we don't. It sort of depends on the availability of food where they live. Um, and so you get what are called eruptions. And, and some years, if you've got a, a, a good big snowy owl population, but their prey population, the lemmings and other um, small animals that they eat, if those populations are low and it's hard to find food, then the, then the snowy owls will migrate further south in the winter looking for food. And we typically um, find them most often along the Lake Michigan Lakeshore. Doesn't mean that's the only place I've seen reports of them out in, in agricultural fields in central Illinois. Um, there was a, a huge eruption several years ago where um, one made his way all the way down to Northern Florida, which caused quite a stir in Florida, let me tell you. <laughs> um, I go there usually once a year for vacation and, and it's one of my birding, bird watching vacation spots. So I'm on these um, email alerts as I get closer to my, my trip and, um, I was getting lots of emails about people just flocking, sorry about that bad pun, but flocking to uh, Northern Florida to, to find the snowy owl and get, a, get their eyes on them. Um, the Eastern screech owls are, are very secretive. They're pretty small. They're only about oh, eight inches tall. And um, they are, uh, are harder to find, but they're here, they're common. It's just that the great horned owls are one of their predators. So they don't tend to make a whole lot of noise and um, uh, they don't want to attract the attention of the great horned owls. But I know at Hastings Lake this, this past winter, there was a tree um, near the, um, the entrance that we share with the Hastings Lake YMCA there. And there was a tree with a hole in it. And it was, there were, people were pretty reliably seeing a, a little screech owl in that hole um, throughout the day. It was day and night, you know, just because it was just hanging out there. And um, two places that you may want to look for the long-eared owl and the short-eared owl are Rollins, Savannah, and, and Lions Woods. Um, I would add Cuba Marsh to that as well for the short-eared owl. Um, they tend to be um, more ground nesters where they live, so they like the open um, the open grasslands that you find at Rollins, Savannah, and um, Cuba Marsh, but um, they also, uh, the long eared owl also likes sort of um, coniferous forests. So Lions Woods has a lot of pine trees and conifers, and so that's a good place to, to look for those guys. In the winter, woodpeckers, uh, most of our woodpeckers stay here, and so you have a, a chance of seeing them. Um, they will come to your feeders and they will, um, especially, they, they especially like suet. So the red-bellied woodpecker down there in the bottom left and the, um, the hairy and the downy, I would say are the, probably the three most common ones you would find in the wintertime. I like those pictures of the hairy and the downy because those birds look almost exactly the same. And there's a couple real key things to help you tell the difference between them. First of all, the hairy woodpecker is a little less common than the downy. It's also bigger and it has a longer beak in proportion to the size of its head. Um, the downy woodpecker, you can see uh, that the beak compared to the size of its head is much smaller. 
Now, if you've got these two right next to each other, it's fairly easy to see the size difference, but if they're not there, if they're not at the same feet or at the same time, it can be a little tricky. So look at that, that proportion of the beak to the head. The pileated woodpecker there in the center, um, they're becoming more common in the county. They used to be much more common, uh, but they need big areas of wood, wooded areas uh, where you can have a nice mixture of, of um, both dead and, and live trees because one of their favorite foods are carpenter ants. And uh, one of the things that I've heard recently about why we're seeing more of them is, um, well, we've been doing a lot of restoration work in a lot of our bigger forested areas, which has opened them up a little bit more and allowed for more, um, uh, more space for the pileated woodpeckers. But um, unfortunately, you may all be familiar with the emerald ash borer and it has just decimated the ash trees in our area. And so what we have is a lot of dead standing trees. And when that happens, you get um, a variety of insects that come in. And one of the insects that have come in are the, um, the carpenter ants. And that is one of the favorite foods of the pileated woodpecker. So they are able to find enough food, enough space. And so they're, they're, um, we're finding more of them here. These are a really big woodpecker. They're about as big as a crow. So when you see one, you know you've seen it. <laughs> um, and then one of my favorites, the red-headed woodpecker, again, they like much more open woodlands. And so we're seeing more of these birds down in the southern part of the county where we've been doing a lot of oak woodland restoration and opening up the, the, uh, the woods so that more sunlight reaches the floor to help more oak trees grow. And they have just, it's almost like they're wearing a little red hat there. It's good. The red goes all the way down, um, both on their chin and on the back of their neck. And they have a very um, uh, blocky black and white pattern on their back, whereas the red bellied there down at the bottom, his head is, and chin are not completely red and he has more of a zebra striped um, appearance on his back. He does have a little tiny red belly patch but it's tough to see unless you've got the bird in your hand. And the passerines that visit our feeders in the winter um, or might be creeping around on our trees looking for insects in the bark. So the brown creepers, the pine siskins uh, come here in the winter time. Um, the juncos come here in the winter time, but the chickadees, the nuthatches, both the red breasted and the white breasted and the goldfinches are here year round. Very often folks think the goldfinches have left because the males transition out of their bright yellow color with that black cap into something a little bit more drab, um, but they're here all winter long and they, uh, they will visit our seed feeders and our suet feeders looking for um, um, food. And then if you have the ability to have a heated bird bath in your backyard, you have a much better chance of attracting these birds and keeping them in your yard. And then of course, I'm here again about my native plants. A lot of these birds are going to eat the seeds of native plants um, or will eat the insects that might be overwintering under the bark of some of our native trees. So if you can include any native plants into your home landscape, it'll just attract even more birds. All right, I saw the question pop up in the chat here. Oh, okay. All right. So that, um, I just want to give a little uh, plug for some of our upcoming virtual programs. If you are interested in birding, uh, as I said, right now um, is a really great time to get started. And I can't recommend enough joining um, one of our educators, Mark Hurley. Uh, Mark is the one that has taught me most of the birds that I know. <laughs> I first, Mark hired me over 20 some years ago as an intern. So I've been birding with Mark for many, many years. He has been doing a series called Bird Walk and Listen. It's at eight o'clock in the morning on May 20th next week. Um, and uh, you can register for that on our website and get a, a Zoom link. And Mark is actually out walking in the woods um, live and, and answering questions about birds, trying to capture some of them on, on camera and, and at least get their calls and helping you to, to learn some of that. So again, this is all virtual right now, but um, it's become quite a popular program this spring. Um, also on the 20th in the evening, we have a program called Hiking in Lake County, if you're interested in learning more about the various hiking opportunities. 
And then on Sunday, May 23rd, in honor of World Turtle Day, we have a program um, about the turtles of Lake County. Uh, we'll be teaching you um, about the different species that live here. You'll get to meet a few live turtles virtually. And then also we'll, we'll talk a lot about some of the things that we can do uh, to help our turtles, especially in the spring, as a lot of the females are coming out of their ponds and lakes and rivers and trying to find somewhere to lay their eggs on land. We also often find them crossing the road. So I'm going to turn my camera back on here and we will check the chat for any more questions. Hi, Eileen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot, a lot of diversity, isn't there, in our area? Yes, and then and that's just scratching the surface. I didn't want to bore you with all 351 species tonight. Right. What <laughs> and, is the most exotic or surprising bird that you've seen in our area? Oh, this is like a highlight of my birding life. Um, several years ago, so each spring we um, we take our volunteers when it's not a global pandemic. We take our teaching volunteers on what we call the van trip. We drive around Lake County, we visit sites where we teach and we talk about various projects and things that are going on. But we also sneak in a few little stops for bird watching in the spring. And a few years ago, we were at Illinois Beach State Park in the South Unit. And we're all looking in the dunes and we're looking for birds. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm looking and I'm seeing this bird. And I'm so struck by the bird that I can't speak. And I'm, I'm my, Mark, who I mentioned earlier, is one of my coworkers, and we've been birding together for a lot of the years. And I'm hitting him because I can't get it out. It was a scissor-tailed flycatcher. So this is a bird that typically is not found in our area. Um, you see them in Texas and that sort of thing. For some reason, he wound up in Lake County. And it is a type of bird that's an insect eater. And they have these super long feathers, um, the males that are a part of their breeding plumage that, I mean, I can't get it into the screen, but these long plumes that come off their tail feathers. And it was one of those things where I'm just, and he spotted it at the same time I started smacking him because I couldn't talk, but um, that probably here in Lake County, um, that was the highlight okay. uh, for me. And then I did uh, drag my sisters once on a family trip to Ireland out to, um, you may be familiar with the Skellig Islands um, off the coast mm -hmm. of Southwest Island. It's where Ireland, it's where one of the Star Wars movies were filmed. Uh, but they have colonies of puffins. Oh. And I've always wanted to see a puffin. So my poor sister who gets seasick came out in the boat with me. And uh, we had to climb this rock and, and just, it was a, a day that I will remember the rest of my life. So um, that's cool. Um, let's see. So Eileen, there's a question here. Someone would like to know, do you keep a book um, on the birds you see? Yes. And actually, I don't have a slide about bird guides in, in this presentation, but I really recommend going to the library um, and looking and checking out a few different bird guides and trying them out in the field and see which one you like before you make that purchase. And yes, I, I'm a Peterson girl. I like the Roger Tory Peterson bird uh, guide. There's also the, the David Sibley guides are very popular. Um, and I have a book from when I first started really seriously bird watching that the bindings, the pages are falling out, but I have notes next to every bird, um, the date I saw it for the first time and any little notes. So yes, I do keep a book and I keep track. And I think a lot of bird watchers keep what we call a life list where you keep track of all the different species you've seen. And um, last time I tallied mine up, I'm, I'm, I need to do some work. I'm only at like 550 species and there's about nine, there's close to 10,000 different species of birds worldwide. Wow. I don't plan to get all of them, <laughs> but I do plan to do a lot more bird watching once my kids are, are have graduated college and I retire. So <laughs> nice hobby. Yes. Um, there's someone here who wrote in the chat, a bald eagle stopped in a patch of trees across my home a few weeks ago. I live near just playing this river trail in Lincolnshire. Yes, it, yes, and that's, I forgot to mention that we very often see them flying along the Des Plaines River. Now, I don't know if they're nesting in that area. I have not heard, um, but if they can find what they need for their, their habitat requirements, if they can find food, if they can find shelter, if they can find space, um, you know, a place to make a nest, they may stay, but they're definitely utilizing the Des Plaines River as a, as a um, 
uh, both a migration route and also for feeding. Now, right now the water's pretty low. So um, I would imagine that there might be some pockets along the river where the fish are pretty concentrated and might be pretty easy to find, but um, it's not unusual to see them at the Lake at Independence Grove either. And there's a question, what is the best online site to help in identifying bird species? Um, I'm going to pop it in the chat, but it's called All About Birds, and it's done through the, um, to, through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And all you got to do is Google All About Birds, and um, you will, it'll come up. They also, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology also has a really great app that you can have on your phone or mobile device, and it's called the Merlin Bird ID app. Um, and that you can go to the app store on your phone and, and, and find that one. And I really like it because it has this great tool where if you're not sure what you're seeing, it asks you a few questions to sort of narrow down the possibilities. And it's based on the time of the year, your geographic location, the size of the bird, the color of the bird. And then it gives you a few different birds to kind of choose from. And it helps you to narrow it down a little bit. And then it also, I use it a lot actually out in the field, especially in the spring uh, when the when the birds are migrating through. And like I said before, it's like my old friends coming back that I haven't seen in years. So I might forget what they sound like and I'll know that it's a new bird. Like, Wait a minute, that's not somebody that's been here. And I think I know what it is, but I can play their call on my phone. And then I know for sure, like even if I can't see the bird, I know it's a, um, you know, a golden wing warbler or something. It's amazing. Um, someone writes, I'm going on my first bird migration hike with McHenry Conservation at Glacier Park. What do you recommend I bring with me? So I would dress comfortably for the weather. I would bring a pair of binoculars and if you have them, if you don't very often, and I can't speak for them, um, but very often, I know we always try to have a few extra pairs of binoculars. Um, around and then if you've got a bird book that you um, you you might want to check one out from the library or if you've got one I would bring that um, but that's pretty much all you need are your you know and again uh, this time of year just dress for the weather and it, it, depending where you're going um, long lightweight long pants and long sleeves just helps protect you from any um, insects that might be crawling and flying around and, and makes it a more enjoyable experience. Those are some good questions. Yeah. Um, so Eileen, I just thank you so much for joining us. And it was just great that, you know, you weren't just giving this lecture, but you really have a, a true enthusiasm for the topic. And so that came across. And um, so thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, and thank you for everyone joining us at home. I hope that you found this really helpful and it helps you in identifying birds that you might see on your walks in the preserves or just even in your backyard. And um, yes, I hope that you, you can use this and enjoy it. Yep, thank you again. And um, get out there and enjoy the open spaces this, um, this year and, and practice your birding. And hopefully we'll see you in person very soon where we can actually take you with us on a walk and help you identify the birds and the plants along the trails. That sounds great. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.